everyone. We have signups from over 17 countries. Hooray! And 186 over. In fact, it might hit 200. I know there are many people still coming in. I just want to warmly welcome everyone. I'm Grace, as you can see from my name there here from Malaysia. I'm the executive director for the Asia Evangelical Alliance Women Commission. And the Women Commission uh, is hosting this event. Um, you know, this topic is very unique. Uh, we don't hear a lot about it because many of us like to uh, sweep our sorrows under the carpet, so to speak. But we are in unprecedented times. We are in a global pandemic and many Grace, you're muted. Have you not, did you not hear me at all? Did you hear me at all? Now we hear you. We heard oh. you um, and then you just got muted not too long ago. Okay, so you did catch some of it. All right, I, I was just expressing how we are in an unprecedented time, meaning in our lifetime, many of us have never experienced before. Um, and many of us have lost loved ones, whether it be our uh, uh, husband, uh, our grandparents, our dear friend, and many have even lost pastors due to this unseen enemy that we call the virus. And it's been heartbreaking for a lot of us. Sorry, Grace, you're muted again. Okay, thank you, Yvonne. I think I better stay away from my computer. <laughs> um, and so I just want to welcome you. I pray that all of us will be ministered. We've been praying for each one of you that the Holy Spirit will sit with you. And in fact, I'm very confident that he's sitting with every one of us. So I want you to just uh, maybe spend a moment to just welcome the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is sent to us as our comforter, as the ever-present Lord, as the one who's able to speak to us, minister to us. To be very honest, uh, Mahoko will be the first one to admit, she's not going to be the one who minister. I am not going to, even those of us who have a part in it, uh, we are powerless. But the Holy Spirit is the one who's going to minister to us through these two hours and beyond. And we know him. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to this event acknowledging you as the Lord and the one who will minister to us and speak to us in a very unique individual way, as well as in a corporate way. We thank you, Lord Father, for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, you know, I, I, I often like to uh, kind of get a bit of a... a a joyful time. So uh, I hope it's not in, inappropriate, but can you just wave to each other? Uh, it's, we, we, I want us to feel together, although we are geographically distant, but we are actually together in one space right now. And I, I love us to use the chat room to uh, encourage one another. And if you hear anything that brings uh, a witness to you, type it in because I think it will bless somebody else as well. Amen. So with that, I'd like us to uh, spend uh, a time, a short time in worship with one song. Um, this is a familiar song and I would like us to just sing along. You can stay muted, but sing along, worship the Lord with all your heart and allow or just be quiet and allow the song to minister to you. So let's have this time of worship.
what a powerful name the Lord Jesus Christ is, the Lord whom we serve, the Lord who gives us everything that we need in life and godliness. So we are going straight to uh, the, the teaching and sharing by uh, none other than uh, Mahoko. Um, Mahoko graduated from Ashbury Theological Seminary and was a missionary to India. She also taught at the South India Biblical Seminary. So many of you who are now signing in from India, you have found a friend who knows you as well. She is now a pastor. She will share a lot in greater detail uh, as she opens up to us uh, in a minute. She's uh, also a practicing, practicing clinical psychologist and social worker. Having known her these past few months, Maoko has become a dear friend, very kind, very sensitive. Uh, for this talk, I've told her to roar a little bit like a lion. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and show, you know, the, the, the strength that she, the inner strength that she really does have. Uh, and even as she shares, let's all also be praying together with her that the Holy Spirit will use her. She has expressed a little bit of reservation with the language, having to speak in English, but I'm very confident in the Lord that the right words will all come out to speak to us. Uh, I, I want to quickly mention uh, her message will be in two parts. There will be this first part, and then subsequently we have invited uh, two, two um dear ladies to share their grief stories and then we will have uh, the part two followed by the breakout room the breakout room is very essential for us to be in a small group to share our, our experiences as well as pray for each other amen so with that Marco, the lord be with you please take over hey thank you grace First of all, I would like to praise God for this opportunity to gather together and learn about grief care. By God's grace, he gathered us together from all over the world, 17 different countries. I trust in God that he will bless this time. I also thank all of you, each one of you, for attending this seminar. Arigatou gozaimasu. I pray that this time of gathering is not just learning about grief care, but realizing deep in our hearts and souls that grief care is a central mission, both for uh, individual Christians and for our churches, Christian communities, especially during and after COVID-19. You may ask, what is the role of the church during and after COVID-19? I answer by the grace of God, that is grief care. Through grief care, people realize that God is near each one of us and that he consoles us and transforms us into his image. That is in the form of a loving and caring Christian and Christian community. I'm going to talk more about this in this seminar. Let me share the screen with you. Let me introduce myself. I'm a pastor, clinical psychologist, and social worker. I'm the pastor of Cookie Church of Japan Holiness Church. This is a picture of our church. It's a very small church, and it's in a city called Cookie here, Cookie, meaning long lasting joy. It's like Christmas, isn't it? It's in a city, a cookie city is in the northern part of Saitama prefecture. This is a picture of Japan and next to Tokyo, here is Saitama. And in the northern part of it, there's a city called Kuki. Because this is a very small congregation on, on, having only about 10 members, we have been continuing to gather together for prayer and worship services. 
of course, wearing masks and opening windows. This picture is a park near my church, having beautiful cherry blossoms and yellow flowers contrasted. It's called Gongendo. You can see this scene only for about a week or so in April. Please make sure to visit us when you come to Japan, maybe once the COVID-19 is over. I'm also a school counselor at junior high school. We, are, we have been so many problems due to COVID-19. For example, we had higher rates of suicide last year, especially of junior high and high school kids in Japan. At school where I'm serving, I have more kids who come to me saying, I want to die. We also have higher rates of abuse at home. I'm estimating that I'll be facing more and more problems as a counselor from now on, even after the COVID-19 crisis. Now is a time when people need heart care, psychological care, and even so spiritual care. I am also a director of spiritual ministry, Tarisa Kum. The main mission of Tarisa Kum is grief care. In the book of Mark, chapter five, Jesus came to the daughter of Jairus saying, Tarisa Kum, little, little girl, wake up. When one loses someone or something attached, important, he or she becomes very sad and depressed having little power to keep going. Having those people around us, you might want to help them. But haven't you had times when you felt so powerless without any word to encourage them? But the scripture says, things which are impossible with men are possible with God, praise to him. We can bring people to Christ, the comforter, by listening to them and praying with them, or just being present with them. As Jairus brought Jesus to his daughter when she was dying, we Christians want to be instruments of God's love and comfort. This is the Christian way of grief care, and this is part of the mission of each Christian and Christian community. And this is a mission of spiritual ministry of Tarisa Kum. I'm going to talk more about it, about grief care in this presentation. Today's contents, as Grace explained before, two parts. What is grief care? Why is it needed during COVID-19 crisis? And then we are gonna learn from Jesus how to practice grief care, creating compassionate community. So now, first, what is grief care? Why is it needed? What is grief care for? Nobody believes that you do not need grief care. But there are some time or some people who are not good at paying attention, not only to our own losses and grief, but others' grief also. Some mistakenly believe that embracing or facing grief will slow us down and hinder us from achieving our goal. We might see grief and loss as interruption. Therefore, we encourage each other by saying, you have to get over your loss, or you shouldn't be grieving that long, or three years have passed. Maybe it's time to move on, stand up, well, why, why do you say that? Why do you avoid facing loss and grief? One reason might be a controlling issue. You do not want to lose control over your lives. I'm going to talk more about it specifically later, but during COVID-19, we have lost controls in many areas, haven't we? When you lose control, you become very, very unstable. Our fear of losing control may be a significant factor in avoiding grief and loss. You might feel uncomfortable with what might happen to you 
if you allow yourself to feel your own sadness, sorrow, and pain. So you hide them instead of paying attention to them. But the question is, should you get over your grief? Is it something that you should get over? For example, I have often counseled people who lost a child. Many times they say, I don't want to get over this pain. I actually don't like the phrase get over. I refuse to get over because getting over means to me forgetting. I don't want to forget my child. I want to live with this pain and memories of my child. In the past, people believed that grief work involved a process of disconnecting the tie between the living one and the one deceased. In other words, you are encouraged to let go of the deceased and use your energy to invest in another relationship, new relationship in this world, on this earth, in order to adjust to life without them. This model stressed the importance of moving on as quickly as possible to return to normal life. The assumption was that the grief process was not normal. Therefore, the shorter, the better. However, the research continued, and now we know that that is not the case. Grieving is a normal process, and by grieving, you continue to embrace the time you had with your loved ones. This is not the end of the relationship. I repeat, this is not the end of the relationship. As you embrace your memories with your loved ones, you take this loss into your lives and your stories. I'm not saying that the process is easy. It's so painful that we can't do it on our own. Sometimes you might feel like God is so far away, indifferent. But no matter how you feel, God is close to you. Psalm 23, 4 says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I would fear no evil, for you are with me. You don't need to get over grief. You don't need to forget your loved ones, but instead you can let it become a part of yourself. You remember them, and with the pain and sorrow, you come to cross to God. Then you are able to experience his love deep in your heart. I briefly want to look at scripture. In Genesis 3, God created Adam and Eve in his image, that he could enjoy fellowship with them. But as you know, Adam and Eve sinned. So they hid from the Lord among the trees in the garden. Then God was searching for them saying, where are you? Joy and expectation of God turned into pain and sorrow. Imagine the pain of God when he lost the fellowship with Adam and Eve. Maybe God is the first one who needed grief care. At the same time, we lost, we lost the image of God, which is painful too. But the amazing grace is he never gave up. Since Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden, God has been searching even now for men and women asking, where are you? Where are you? Because he wants to restore relationship with us and he wants to transform us into his image, more loving and caring person. In order to achieve it, he sent Jesus Christ who died on the cross that he might break the wall between God and the human and that we might have fellowship with God, close to him. God is not far away being indifferent. He cares about us. In time of pain and sorrow, he comes near the one who is grieving. As we walk in the shadow of death, we experience the love of God deep in our souls. Let me share my story with you. 
a few years ago, I lost my teacher and pastor whom I respect. <clears throat> Her name is Reverend Miyoko Hase. She was affected by brain cancer and passed away within a year after she was diagnosed. When she found out she had cancer and knew that she didn't have long to live, she said, God has given me so many bless blessings in my life. So I want to appreciate this cancer as gift of God. I praise God that I can come close to him, close to him because of this cancer. Well, normally people complain. Maybe I complain. Well, I'm sure I complain. Why me? Why did God allow it to happen to me? Well, this is a natural response, I think. But she didn't do that. She embraced her cancer, sorrow, and pain as gift from God. Every time I went to her room, I was encouraged by her. Well, I probably should have been the one who encouraged her. But I was in too much pain from losing her to do so. <clears throat> I was crying all the time beside her bed. She gave me so many words to remember. I'm praying for you. God is going to use you, so be faithful to him. Those words from her have been resonating deep in my souls even now. Not only her words, but her way of living her life to her last minutes of this earthly life. The way she embraced her pain and sorrow and death, and she trusted in God's goodness has been empowering, empowering me in my daily ministry even now. Sharing this, this testimony, I pray that many of you also will be encouraged. Let me talk to you about grief care. What is grief first? Grief is to feel anguish, sorrow, pain, bitterness due to loss. It is a normal and natural response to loss. This means when we love someone attached, important, we are going to be in great anguish. The feeling is so strong that you might think, I will never get well. Well, there is something wrong with me. You might feel that, but don't worry. It is a natural and normal response. On the other hand, grieving is an individual experience too. There is no right or wrong way to grieve. There are different ways of showing emotions and different ways of dealing with one's pain. For example, one day a child passes away. The mother might cry so hard, but the father might not. In a few days, the father goes to work, looks fine. Seeing him go to work, the mother might say, how can you go to work? Don't you care that you lost your son? You should be crying, not going to work. Well, I understand how the mother feels and why she wants to say that, but you never know how the father is feeling. Grieving is an individual experience. He might have a different way of showing his pain. And being different isn't wrong. And I want you to remember, no one has a right to determine how someone else should grieve. Rather, we want to respect each other's way of showing emotion and care about each other accordingly. Grief care is grief care, not grief cure. Henry Nowen says, care is something other than cure. Cure means change. A doctor, a lawyer, a minister, a social worker, they all want to use their professional skills to bring about changes in people's lives. But cure can easily become violent, manipulative, and even destructive if it does not grow out of care, if it does not grow out of care. Care is being with, crying out with, suffering with, 
feeling with. Care is compassion. It is claiming the truth. The other person is my brother or sister, human, mortal, vulnerable like I am. When care is our first concern, cure can be received as a gift. Often we are not able to cure, but we are always able to care. To care is human. We need to remember grief care is not grief care, cure, but grief care. In listening to people grieving, we are tempted to give a quick advice. You'll be okay, that's fine, before listening carefully. But a person who is talking most often is not asking you a piece of advice, but someone who cares. She or he wants someone who cares. That is being with and crying out with him or her. It is important to remember the difference between care and cure. And we want to be a caring person and we want to make caring our first concern so that God brings cure to the person as a gift. Let's look at losses during COVID-19. What did you lose? And what are you losing? It is said that there are two types of losses here, primary losses and secondary losses. Primary losses are obvious ones, usually visible, such as, such as person or object, so on. Secondary losses, sometimes referred to as hidden losses, are harder to recognize and most often associated with the impact or meaning of the loss. Second losses may be harder to identify, yet often the secondary loss could affect persons severely. For example, we have natural disasters such as earthquakes and floods in Japan. During that time, houses here are corrupted, the primary loss, and they are forced to live in a temporary housings. Here, this is a typical temporary housings until the houses are rebuilt. As you see, less space and less privacy. People are already, already hurt due to the primary loss and as they live in these temporary housings, their stress levels become very high, which affect family relationships in negative ways. The divorce rates goes up. The primary loss, such as houses, maybe can be rebuilt, but the secondary loss, family intimacy is lost and can never be recover recovered sometimes. Okay, now, I want to introduce, I want to talk about some losses as you might have experienced. First, social loss. Social distance, lockdown, and stay home requests minimize emotional and physical intimacy, which result in dissolution of intimate relationships involving partners, family, and friends. Though we Japanese don't hug or shake hands, as often as people from Western cultures, we still miss it among close friends. By spending time with friends, you can talk about your concerns and burdens. As you do so, you let go of your stress and keep mental health. But now you don't have a chance to do so as much as you want, as freely as you want. In Japan during COVID-19, the suicide rate among women skyrocketed. It is said that one of the reasons for this is social loss. Because of being deprived of time to get together, some might find it too difficult to deal with stress. Next, loss of employment, which could severely damage you and your family members. You began to worry about how you will live without proper salaries. But losing jobs could also affect various other areas of your life. By losing jobs, you lose roles such as salesman, worker, and so on. And you also might lose confidence. 
that you can take care of yourself and your family. You lose confidence. Next, loss of intimacy. Loss of, loss of intimacy among family members. Due to stay home request, families stay together longer hours than before. If you are close family, you might find it happy to be able to stay together. But not all families are like that because all members of the families have to live under certain restrictions without freedom of choice, they feel stressed. You don't know how to deal with stress, so you take out your frustration on family members, which causes domestic violence and abuse. And last, loss of loved ones without opportunities to say goodbye. Many lost their loved ones due to COVID-19. Saying goodbye to the loved ones is itself very sorrowful under any situation. But during COVID-19, people are not allowed to visit hospitals at the time of death, or the worse, sometimes you can't see them until after they are cremated. Since you don't have a chance to say goodbye, it is very, very difficult for you to accept the fact the person has passed away. The grieving process is frozen or delayed. This is called ambiguous loss here, ambiguous loss. That is your loved one being physically absent, but psychologically still present. It's difficult to accept the fact the person is dead. There is no clue about how to cope and you might be overwhelmed by feelings of helplessness, self-blame, anxiety, and depression. These multiple losses could change your identities, challenge your identities, because your identity, who you are, is defined in terms of the groups or categories to which you belong, social identities, the roles they occupy, role identities, and so on. For example, my friend lost her husband due to illness. She was saying, I don't want to cook anymore because I don't have anyone who eats my meals. I'm all alone. She lost her role as wife. Now she was challenged to adapt to a new identity. Next, I want to talk about grief is a holistic experience. It can affect you cognitively, physically, emotionally, behaviorally, and spiritually. I'm going to give you two examples from behavioral and spiritual. Behavioral. Grief affects your behavior also. At the school where I work as a school counselor, we had a student who have lost his father. He didn't have energy to come to school anymore. Teacher encouraged him to move forward, to come to school, saying, well, you should stand up. You should come to school. Otherwise, your father, who passed away, would worry about you and crying. But just this student wasn't able to come to school. He simply needed time to rest before he restarted and come to school. There is nothing wrong with taking time. You can't just expect people to return to your normal life after they lost a loved ones. I also want to point out that spiritual one, that grief can affect your spiritual life. In my church, we have a new Christian lady who was baptized a few months ago. She often asks, why did God send us, allow, permit this COVID-19 pandemic, which is killing so many people? Why doesn't he stop it? These questions are coming out of our souls, her souls and our souls, which cause spiritual pain. In grieving, in giving grief care, you want to remember that grief is a holistic experience. It can affect cognitively, physically, emotionally, 
behaviorally and spiritually. Therefore, when you are listening to people grieving, you want to be touching different areas of the person. Few more slides to go. We have looked at losses due to COVID-19. Now, let me introduce a grief model. There are many models and theories to explain how we deal with grief. One classic and famous one is Kubler-Ross five-stage model. This model helps you understand how a profound feeling of grief is processed emotionally. These five stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. These stages may not come to pass, may not all come to pass, and may often occur in various orders. I'm going to apply this model to this pandemic situation, which goes like this. Denial stage. This virus won't affect us, affect me. Well, my first reaction to COVID-19 was a belief that it didn't affect me as much as it is doing other countries. I have been in the denial stage until last week, I had a high fever and body pain and I was suffering from this disease. And I went to the doctor and the doctor said, well, you probably have COVID-19. And I was thinking maybe I'm giving this seminar with this COVID-19. But the doctor said, well, you're safe. You didn't have it. The test was minus. I had been in a doubting stage. Next stage, anger. You are making me stay home and taking away my activities. Well, I have been patient for such a long time, but gradually I began to be angry because all the events have been, are beginning to be canceled, begin to feel anger and bargaining. Okay, I keep social distance for two weeks everything will be better, right? Or I could just wear my mask and stay home. Then this whole situation won't affect me, right? This is a bargaining. And sadness. I don't know when this is going to end. I don't know what else I can do. I feel so sad. And acceptance. This is happening. I have to figure out how to proceed. Well, I can wash my hands. I can keep a safe distance. I can learn how to work virtually. Well, when you come to the stage of acceptance, you somehow feel energy or peace to live in this situation. You might feel that you can live with it. However, acceptance doesn't mean that you are okay with a loss or the, well, the grieving process is now officially over. It doesn't mean that. You may go back to anger stage, sadness stage. You may have experienced all the stages or some stages, but knowing these stages help you frame and identify what you may be feeling. To this five stage model, David Kessler added the sixth stage. That is meaning. Meaning is what we make from one's loss. Viktor Frankl, a psychiatrist who wrote of his experience in a Nazi concentration camp says, man is not destroyed by suffering, but he is destroyed by suffering without meaning. He also said, quest for meaning is a key to mental health. It's natural for us to seek for meaning when we face crises. Of course, even, we, even if we find meaning, the situation doesn't change, but finding meaning will empower us to find a path and to go forward. So now, how do you seek meaning? One way is by prayer. During this pandemic, people ask, what does this COVID-19 pandemic mean? It's not easy to find a clear cut answer to it. I believe that you don't need to rush out to find meaning. But the power of continuing to ask questions and praying to God, Lord, teach us what, if, what you want us to learn from this situation. 
it humbles ourselves under the mighty hand of God. God reveals himself in his time, deep in our soul. Only when, only when he shows himself, we find meaning in this situation. And the meaning is different for each person. One may find the importance of a family, which leads to sifting their priorities in life. God will show us meaning for each person. And second, by sharing each other's stories. By listening to people's stories, you reflect your own experiences. And by sharing your stories to people who listen to you carefully, attentively, you take in what you have lost into your life and find, find meaning as you tell your story. So now, end of the first part, let's listen to our sister's stories, Ashima and Grace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Mahoko, for sharing with us and the grief stories and for, and for giving me this time where I can share my story. Oxygen. Oxygen is something that is a gift from God and we have it freely. We have the freedom of breathing. But in this time of pandemic of COVID-19, India was gasping for every single breath. Every single breath as we as sisters now are sitting, we were gasping for every single breath. God has given us this freedom to breathe freely. You know, we have different violations of right to life, but we have a gift of free breath which was taken away from us in these times of pandemic. There was pain, suffering, grief all around us. We were surrounded by all these emotions of grief and pain. I still remember that in those times when we were, where we were being hit by this uh, worst ever COVID wave, I used to feel frightened in picking up my phone because picking up my cell phone was like, I am going to open some messages where I see my fellow brothers and sisters and daughters die or hear their suffering or come to know that they are, they are, they are in pain. How could we do something about that? We would get calls and I would get calls where women are crying and they're saying as what sister Mohoko shared that there is domestic violence, we are being, beaten up and there is so much of abuse and how can you help us? How can I reach out to our sisters at this time? There were calls where I was, where a child just eight years old, a child who is just barely eight years old was being sold for child marriages. This time was a time where people thought that, oh, let's sell our daughters, let's get them married, let there be child marriage. Those children were grieving. Those children were looking out for help. Those children were praying to Jesus, to God, to help them, to rescue them. Difficult times, my daughters, my, my own story was that my daughters were so scared to step out of the house, to step out of the room, because there were reports that it is airborne. And if they step out, they will catch COVID or something bad will happen to them. And in those times, I would like to share with you a story of hope, grieving in hope, Priya. Priya from the state of the Eastern part of India, Bihar. In the month of April, at the last bath of April, she lost both her parents. India has a huge number of orphan and semi-orphan children. And Priya was just 14 years of age when she lost her parent. Her mother told her that, you know, her mother, and she herself was suffering from COVID. And her mother told her that, I'm not feeling well, please cut some mangoes for me or cut some fruits for me. And she was giving it despite she not feeling well. Priya was nursing her mother because people couldn't reach out at these times. You can't reach out to your loved ones at these times. And Priya would step out despite having COVID and would give her fruits and cut fruits and give fruits to her. And, and Priya kept remembering when she was sharing her story with me that my mother said that she is going to dance once when she is absolutely fine, that they are going to rejoice and they're going to dance together. 
and be happy and hopeful and joyful in these times. Priya lost her parents. She is a child who is studying in one of our study centers in the eastern part of India. She lost her parents. Priya herself encountered, you, I don't know whether you've been heard about it, but white fungus and black fungus that has been spreading around in India and she got white fungus. But despite that, Priya and I, when, whenever I used to speak, I used to continue speaking to her. She had a mobile, so I could talk to her and I was reaching out to Priya. And Priya just was quiet. Loneliness, depression, the state of hopelessness was surrounding her. She did not have anything to say. Then with continuous, then us people, our volunteers, our team started taking care of Priya. She was in, in a care of a pastor. There was a pastoral home that there was being given care. And just recently I spoke to Priya. And you know what Priya told me? And she's coming from a non-Christian background. I think God touched her, transformed her heart. Even in this time of darkness, we see light. And she comes and tells me when recently I spoke to her, she said, I'm, I'm doing better. I said, how can you say that, that you're doing better, Priya? And she said that, I feel my parents have gone to the permanent place. I am here in the temporary place, but my parents are up above in the permanent place. And we are going to very soon rejoice and dance together what she told me before her death. She's grieving in hope. This taught me a lot. This time of pandemic has taught me a lot. And one thing that I have learned personally that we live in God's unshakable kingdom. And we as church, as what you shared, Sister Mahoko, and the role even Jesus suffered as we are suffering, even Jesus suffered for us up on the cross. Now we as humans can feel the pain and grief in this time of pandemic, what our dear Lord suffered. And in this state of grief, hopelessness, sadness that surrounds us and where we lose our loved ones. And I could feel the pain of Priya who lost her parents, both her parents and now is orphan and doesn't know where to go, what to do what not to do, whom is she going to reach out to? I just told her one thing, let us not be discouraged as we are united in love, the love of God, the love of our savior, our Jesus. God rescued us. We could not rescue ourselves. He rescued us. He brought us into the light, not darkness, but he chose and gave us the light. And as we grieve in these times, as we are grieving with one another in these times, when we come together and when we are praying and we are seeking for God's mercy for India and for the other countries now, where reports are coming in of stricter lockdowns of the virus spreading, we are praying that nothing, nothing, that God's unshakable kingdom stands strong. And I would just leave you the story that I shared. And I just, just would like to leave you with this verse that has been there with me, that I've held on to in these times. It's from Psalm 56, verse 8. And as we cry, our tears are coming down, rolling down. And sometimes we just can't stop crying also. But these tears are prayers too. These tears that are rolling down from each of our eyes are prayers to, that are traveling to God. We can't speak. We become numb. Our hearts go cold. 
we don't know what to say, but our tears, our prayers that are reaching to God. So at this time, when I have many, many stories, many stories that I can carry on and share with children, with young girls being sold at this time where parents are selling them and they are grieving and wanting that how this pandemic is becoming a time where right of life is being violated, where their freedom is being violated, where there is nobody to step up and to listen to their shouts and screams and pain and sorrow. But I would like to end over here and would like to thank Sister Mohoko for this time. Thank you. Amen. Uh, we have Grace Tan from Malaysia who will share her story. Um, so Grace, can you turn on your... Uh... Hello, can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Yes, can we hear can me? hear you. Okay. Uh, two years and three months ago, my husband was diagnosed to have a multi myeloma, a blood cancer that will, will cause a lot of bone pain and easy to get broken bones. It is a progressive cancer. Means it will not, it's not curable, but treatable. And slowly it will get worse and the person can be bedridden at the last stage. Since then, I pray that he won't come to the stage. When time for him to go home to be with the Lord, he will not suffer much and just sleep and go off peacefully. God is good all the time. As I was videoing him, one day as I was videoing him dancing with his walking stick and post in Facebook, a church doctor who is one of the top spine specialists in Asia saw the video. Immediately called us up to say that there's something wrong with his walking. Immediately sent him to MR, MRI and found that there is a lump near his spine and he was in the verge of paralyzing. He was immediately pushed for operation to take out the lump. On January this year, his cancer relapsed and off and on he had bone pain. On May 12th, he was admitted to the hospital because his kidney reading was very high and they did a diagnosis and chemo on him. On the seven days when he was in the hospital, the hospital said they need to do a COVID test on all the patients in the ward because the place where some of the hospital staff stay have COVID cases. That day, the result came out. Five patients, including my husband, tested for COVID. Even when he know he got COVID, my, my husband was very calm. For he told us, God has given him this verse for this journey. Isaiah 26, 3 to 4. You will keep in perfect peace those minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord himself is the rock eternal. On the May, 20th May, as Thursday in the morning, at 6 a.m., while I was praying for my husband, God bring me to a song titled Precious Lord, Take My Hand. The lyric said, Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, let me stand. I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. I can't finish listening the song because I cry and cry half of the day. And I know the Lord was preparing me. Then on Monday morning, 24th, 
me at 3.49 a.m. I listened to the song again. This time I was able to listen to the whole song and have peace. Right after I finished to listen to the song, the phone rang. It was from the hospital saying my husband just passed away at 3.54 a.m. From my own eyes, I saw his health was going worse. His cancer relapsed and his kidney affected. And if he didn't die of COVID, his next few months will be going in and out of the hospital and the hospital will be his second home and have, will have more health issues. And slowly he will feel frustrated and moody, can't live a quality life and we might have lost a joyful man land. God is good and he is in control. Yes, with the COVID and under the care of the hospital, uh, doctors and nurses, he did have a short, painless and ending life. For the three days, he was intubated, sleep and go off peacefully. We can see God really loved my husband very much because he didn't let him suffer much. As of today, it will be one month and one week. He went home to be with the Lord and I must still miss him very much. I know he's in a better place. No more suffering and no more pain. Recently, I went to a supermarket with my son. Unconsciously, I went to get the, wanted to get potato chips because my husband likes it. Then I realized he's no more here and I started to cry in the supermarket. I still cry off and on and I hope I'll get better as the days goes by. I'm glad that we have taken many photos and funny videos of him and family for remembrance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Grace. Uh, Len is a dear friend of ours. Uh, thank you for the courage to share. Uh, you know, uh, Grace Tan uh, was unable to show her face because she says whenever she's been in Zoom throughout this pandemic, it's always with her husband. And this will be the first time she will, if she switches it on, her husband's face will not be there. So she asked to just show the pictures. Um, we have one song called Surrender. Uh, let's close our eyes. It's not a familiar song to many of us, but it's a good song. So let's just be ministered by this song. And then Mahako will do part two.
Okay, sorry, taking time. Thank you, Grace. Now we want to learn from Jesus how to give grief care. What is the role of the church during and after COVID-19? I believe that is grief care, as I, ha as I have been saying, not only by individual, but as a community. The church is a body of Christ, so each member of the body wants to grow to have a compassionate heart and listen and learn to listen to practice to learn to practice grief care sorry which creates a compassionate community we could learn much from psychology on how to give grief care but today i want to look at scripture and want to learn how jesus gave grief care to his disciples Before we look at scripture, let's talk about what it means to have compassion. 
the word compassion means to suffer with. As we have learned from the first half of this seminar, grief care is being with, crying out with, suffering with, feeling with people who are in pain. This is easy to say, but not easy to do. Every time I give counseling to parents who have lost their children by suicide, I feel deep, deep pain in my stomach. They throw various emotions at me. For example, one day, a mother who lost her child by suicide came to me. She sobbed, sobbed, and sobbed without saying anything. Sitting with her sobbing, I felt powerless. I couldn't think of any word to say, but just to be there. Another day, she got so angry at God saying, why didn't God stop my son from dying? Why did God let my son die? I knew she wasn't angry at me, but the feeling of anger is magical. It engulfs me and makes me, makes me feel very uncomfortable. Parents who have lost their children by suicide show different emotions, ups and downs in a very short period. Getting caught up in a swirling vortex of emotions exhausts me. Just being present with the one who throws different emotions at you is itself not easy. And most of the time, there is nothing, absolutely nothing we can do which makes us feel powerless. Being with the one suffering isn't easy. Being compassionate isn't easy. We want to be supportive of people grieving, but there are times when things do not go well with us, supporters, when we might be tempted to avoid them and which ends up hurting them. As human beings, we are limited. However, by admitting our limitation, we want to do our best by doing what we can do, trusting in the Holy Spirit, comforter, a mighty counselor who promised to be with us always. I will read from quotation of Henry Nowen once again. Let us not underestimate how hard it is to be compassionate. Compassion is hard because it requires the inner disposition to go with others to places where they are weak, vulnerable, lonely, and broken. But this is not a spontaneous response to suffering. What we desire most is to do away with suffering by fleeing from it or finding a quick cure for it. Compassion asks us to go where it hurts to enter into the places of pain, to share in brokenness, fear, confusion, and anguish. Compassion challenges us to cry out with those in misery, to mourn with those who are lonely, to weep with those in tears. Compassion requires us to be weak with a weak, vulnerable with a vulnerable, and powerless with a powerless. Compassion means full immersion in the condition of hum human beings, being human. Compassion means full immersion in the condition of being human. Is this something Jesus did? Philippians 2.5 says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mind as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature, God didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to this, even death on the cross. In the field of psychology, there are many skills you can learn, probably you need to learn, and I give those seminars too, in order to give grief care. 
However, the most important thing to remember is that you need to make your mindset transformed. No matter how many skills you learn, if you can't show love and care as Christ did, you could hurt people by using those skills. For example, I have heard a story of one lady who lost her husband. She was desperate for help. She went to church as a last hope of resource. Unfortunately, a pastor gave her advice about how to cope with grief, opening scriptures, without listening to her story carefully first. She said to me later, he didn't care about me. He simply wanted to teach at me. If only he listened to her story and chose to suffer with her, even be with her, she might have found comfort there and maybe come to Christ one day. I repeat, it is, that it is necessary to learn skills, but without having the mindset of Christ, by using the very those skills, we could hurt people deeply and severely. So now, how do you have the mindset of Christ? One way of learning is maybe through suffering and affliction, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7. Praise be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation, who consoles us in all of our affliction, so that we may be able to console those who are in any affliction with the consolation with which we ourselves are consoled by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are abundant for us, so also our consolation is abundant through Christ. If we are being afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. If we are being consoled, it is for your consolation, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we are also suffering. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our consolation. As Paul teaches here, through suffering and affliction, we experience consolation from God deep in our hearts and souls. No human can give that, and so that we may be able to console others. By embracing pain and suffering, coming to Christ, our hearts may be transformed into the image of God, making us more loving and caring. So the point through pain, sorrow, suffering during COVID-19 crisis, our hearts may be changed that we might console others through the love of God. It is unchangeable reality that we have been suffering from COVID-19. It is sad and painful that so many people have passed away due to this. No one can change what has happened and what, what is happening. Feeling pain and sorrow, not alone, but being with Christ, we want to hear from God. What does he want us to learn through this? In Japanese, the word crisis means here, we call it kiki, is dangerous opportunity. Yes, on the one hand, we are in danger, crisis of weakening one's faith because many churches can't get together for worship. Therefore, we need to pray for each other more honestly. And we trust in God that this crisis, this experience might turn into an opportunity to spread the word of God to people around us. Because people are grieving due to the loss of loved ones. Now is a time when people need Christ who consoles them. If only we trust in him through the church of Asia and through the church of all over the world, God's love will spread to friends, families, and communities as never before. Yes, this is crisis, 
Kiki. But this is also an opportunity to evangelize and to bring people into Christ. Finally, I want to touch on how to give grief care by learning from Jesus. Now let's look at Luke 24. You know, after the resurrection, two disciples were on their way to Emmaus. They were talking and discussing what had just happened in Jerusalem. They were in need of grief care. They had lost their loved ones. Jesus on the cross. They had hopes that Jesus was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Now that Jesus was crucified, they had lost hope for the future. They probably didn't know what to believe anymore because what they had believed seemed to have been proven wrong. They were very unstable. Their identities as disciples of Jesus seemed to have vanished. Besides, they were confused because some women had told them that Jesus was alive. So they didn't know what to believe. So they left Jerusalem and were walking to Emmaus. How did Jesus relate to them? First, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them. Remember, compassion means to suffer with someone. He didn't go away from them, but he himself came close to them and chose to walk with them. Second, Jesus listened to their stories without interrupting. Well, Jesus knew what had happened in Jerusalem very, very well. He was the one who went through all of it, but he didn't say, I know, I know that's about me. No, he, he didn't say that. He listened to their stories. He didn't give advice, but first listened. As they talked to Jesus, who is a good listener, they might have been able to put things together. Now they were ready to listen to what Jesus had to say. Then Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Lastly, Jesus was at the table with them. He took the bread and though, sorry, though he was a guest in the house, he took the blessed bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them, acting as host in the house. By doing so, he is saying, I am the Lord of your life. I am in control. You have been through so much pain and sorrow, but I gave my life for you. Don't forget about it. I am the Lord of your life and your family. I am in control of your life. When the disciples received the bread, their eyes were open. Now their spiritual eyes were open and their hearts were empowered. Therefore, and then they got up and returned to Jerusalem. I believe this is the model of grief care. To sum up, what is grief care and how do we do it following Jesus? Draw near to the person grieving and walk with them as Jesus did. Listen to each other's story without judging, interrupting, evaluating or teaching. We want to be good listeners without interrupting, just listen to them carefully. Then, as Jesus did, open scriptures and pray for them and pray with them so that they might meet with Jesus in the midst of their sufferings and pain. Then they might find consolation and meanings in their sufferings. This will, this will make it possible for them to be empowered once again, to stand up and to live their lived, lives. Then invite them into the fellowship of the church, communion, koinonia. 
during COVID-19, we can't sit at the, tip, at the same table physically maybe, but be creative. Maybe by using Zoom as we have been doing. Keep listening and surrounding them with the love of Christ. Provide a safe environment where they can talk when they want to talk. Or they can cry when they want to cry. As Jesus did, we want to serve them by becoming broken bread, taken and given to those who are suffering. By doing so, we pray that their eyes might be open and they see the Lord close to them and they find meaning and hope to live in Christ. Well, this is all I have prepared for this seminar. Thank you very much for listening. Arigatou gozaimashita. I hope that you find some to be helpful. May God bless each one of you and thank you.